I'm going to start streaming right now. And go live. Okay, we are live and I'm going to do the countdown in just a couple seconds here. I leave the screen up a little bit because it's got the subscribe button on it. I think it helps. Good. You look adorable. My beautiful baby. Hi, everyone around the world. Look who I've got in my lap. Here is Fluffy, the white one. Here is Chocolate with the chocolate brown ears. And they are my furry souls. And I love them so much. And I love seeing the furry souls that you all hang out with, too. It is the best feeling. And I just got back from the 2022 Conscious Life Expo, where it was fun to be with people at a conference again in the matter world, even if we still have to wear masks. And there was a wonderful surprise. I was presented this 2022 Conscious Life Expo Truth in Media Award, and I greatly appreciate the honor and extend deep thanks to Robert Quicksilver, Serena Taylor, and their colleagues for keeping Conscious Life Expo going through the difficult COVID pandemic. I learned from Ian that today we broke through 198,000 subscribers. Thank you all so much. And it won't be long before we break through 200,000. So please let me know what you think would be a fun way to celebrate. Ian is going to look for your suggestions in the Earth Files YouTube comments after this broadcast tonight. Meanwhile, this week there have been more ground-shaking booms without explanation. This headline from the New Jersey Patch News about puzzling ground shakings and booms was yesterday, Tuesday, February 9th, quote, People started reported the shaking at about 1.30 p.m. on Tuesday, February 8, 2022, close quote. And this was in Cape May County at the southern tip of New Jersey. According to the Delaware Geological Survey, quote, an odd tremor of the ground and a boom noise were reported from seven New Jersey counties from Cape May to Burlington, Middlesex, Salem, Ocean, Camden, and Mercer counties. Some people said they felt the ground shaking more than once, but the National Weather Service had no weather-related events, and the Delaware Geological Survey had no data on any earthquakes over magnitude 2.5 anywhere near New Jersey on Tuesday, February 9th. The Federal Aviation Administration also reports that it has no record of a sonic boom in the entire New Jersey region on Tuesday, February 9th, and the Maryland Naval Air Station southwest of Cape May County confirmed there were no supersonic flights in the New Jersey area on Tuesday, February 9th. Others, such as Dover Air Force Base in Delaware and the Naval Air Station Oceana in Virginia, said they did not have any flights that would cause a supersonic boom. If anyone listening tonight has any more information, you can reach me confidentially through Proton Mail or Hard US Mail or FedEx, and you can always email me at earthfiles at earthfiles.com to possibly set up 
a meeting by phone, at least to establish contact. Now, while this was going on down here above the earth, after the February 3rd release of more Elon Musk Starlink satellites, some 40 are going to be lost. SpaceX released this statement, quote, Unfortunately, the satellites deployed on Thursday, February 3rd, were significantly impacted by a geomagnetic storm the next day on Friday, February 4th. These storms caused the atmosphere to warm and atmospheric density at our low deployment altitudes to increase. In fact, onboard GPS suggests the escalation speed and severity of the storm caused atmospheric drag to increase up to 50% higher than during previous launches, close quote. SpaceX says there was no orbital, uh, orbital uh, debris created and no satellite parts hitting the ground. SpaceX has launched more than 2,000 Starlink satellites and the Elon Musk company has FCC permission to launch nearly 12,000 satellites. By being closer to our planet and networking together, Starlink satellites are meant to carry large amounts of information rapidly to any point on Earth, even over the oceans and in extremely hard to reach places where fiber optic cables would be expensive to lay down. The fact that we are in 2022 and the sun's geomagnetic storm seem to be getting stronger, it connects to my interview last week with Buddy Bolton, the remote viewer who also does astral projections from his home in the Bronx of New York. He sent me this sketch of a Carrington level solar flare event impacting Earth in January, it impacting Earth in 2024, and an even stronger micronova solar impact on Earth in January of 2036. And you can see, put a number two in the 2024 event, which would be a, a strong Carrington level solar flare, and then number three, uh, that arc of the gold and the orange is what he thinks would be a January 2036 event involving the sun, perhaps at a micronova level. And one of the viewer questions from last week from a man named Mark M was about the layered ET metal set with letters that included a reference to a major alien event in the year 2025. And these, uh, the layered ET metal is what I spent uh, so many years studying, the bismuth magnesium zinc. And the writer said, quote, if the zinc magnesium bismuth is real, and it is, then the type letters that came with it are real. And so the reference to, quote, full contact, close quote, with ETs in 2025 must also be real. There are far too many sources and experiencers talking of this coming event that will be during the 2025 solar maximum, close quote. The reference to the zinc magnesium bismuth is about the layered metal that I investigated from 1996 to 2018. And that was sent to first radio host Art Bell and then letters with me from a U.S. Army sergeant on his way to Iraq. I talked to him on the phone and he said he sent us five letters quoting from his grandfather's late 1940s diary along with the pieces of aluminum that are almost pure and bismuth magnesium zinc metal pieces that are layered and said it was because he did not know if he was going to survive being sent to Iraq. And the grandfather describes being part of a military security unit assigned to stand guard around the perimeter of a wedge-shaped craft that crashed in New Mexico deserts in the late 1940s, probably 1948 or 49, but not Roswell 1947. And the grandfather wrote in his diary page that he saw the bottom of the wedge-shaped craft glowing with light 
And that is where, at some point in his security operation, he allegedly pulled metal pieces off of the bottom. So I thought tonight I would follow up with that question from last week and read to you a few excerpts from the uh, fourth and fifth letter that Art Bell and I had received, a letter uh, beginning that the Army Sergeant had addressed to me in which there is also a reference to an alien-related event occurring on Earth in the year 2025. Quote, My grandfather was a member of the retrieval team sent to the crash site just after the incident was reported. He died in 1974, but not before he had sat down with some of us and talked about the incident. I am currently serving in the military and hold a security clearance and do not wish to go public and risk losing my career and commission. Nonetheless, I would like to briefly tell you what my own grandfather told me about Roswell. In fact, I enclose for your safekeeping samples that were in the possession of my grandfather until he died in 1974 and which I have had since his own estate was settled. As I understand it, they came from the UFO debris and were among a large batch subsequently sent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio from New Mexico. My grandfather was able to, quote, appropriate them and stated that the metallic samples are, quote, pure extract aluminum, close quote. That was the first, those were the first metal samples that were sent. As my granddad stated, the team, meaning the security team that the grandfather was in, arrived at the crash site just after the Army Air Force reported that ground zero location. They found two dead occupants hurled free of the disk and one lone surviving occupant was found within the disk and it was apparent that its left leg was broken. There was a minimal radiation contamination and it was quickly dispersed with a water solvent wash and soon the occupant was dispatched for medical assistance in isolation. The bodies were sent to the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for dispersal to other labs and the debris was also loaded onto three trucks which finished the onload just before the sunset. Granddad was part of the team that went with the surviving occupant. The occupant communicated via telepathic means. It spoke perfect English and communicated the following, quote, The disc was a probe ship dispatched from a launch ship that was stationed at the dimensional gateway to the Terran solar system. The occupants were part of a race of explorers from a solar system 32 light years from Terra. They had been conducting operations on Terra for over 100 years, meaning Earth. Another group was exploring Mars and the moon Io. Each probe ship carried a crew of three. A launch ship had a crew of 100. The disk that crashed had collided with a meteor in orbit of Terra and was attempting to compensate its flight vector, but because of the collision, the inter-atmospheric propulsion system malfunctioned, and the occupants had sent out a, a distress signal to their companions on Mars. The launch ship com- commander made the decision to authorize an attempted soft landing on the New Mexican desert. At the same time, the inter-atmospheric propulsion system had a massive electrical burnout, and the disk was soon virtually helpless. There was another option available to the occupants, but it involved activating the dimensional power plant for deep space travel. That opens an energy vortex around the disk for 1,500 miles in all directions. Activating the dimensional power plant would have resulted in the annihilation of the states of New Mexico, Arizona, California, and portions of Mexico. Possibly even further states would have been affected. So the occupants chose to ride the ship down and hope for the best. 
They literally sacrifice their lives rather than destroy the populations within their proximity. The dimensional power plant was self-destructed and the inner atmospheric propulsion system also deactivated to prevent the technology from falling into the hands of the Terrans. This was done in accordance with their standing orders in regards to any compromise with contact experiences. My granddad spent a total of 26 weeks in the team that examined and debriefed the lone survivor of the Roswell crash. Granddad's affiliation with the project ended when the occupant was to be transported to a long-term facility. The alien was placed on board a U.S. Air Force transport aircraft that was to be sent to Washington, D.C. Regarding the precise location of the crash site, this is from my granddad's journal, quote, Trajectory track was plotted at 31 degrees, 20 minutes to 32 degrees north latitude. Object reversed course exactly without any discernible deviation, proceeding to impact site between San Mateo Mountains and Sierra Blanca. Object debris spotted near Roswell Army Airfield within 30 mile radius of the base. The second set of samples that I dispatched, and now he refers to the bismuth magnesium zinc samples. Quoting from my granddad's journal, quote, sample extraction, this is now the layered metal, radiated light for a full three hours, originally located on central underside of wedge-shaped disc, speculate some type of shielding to enable craft and crew to survive accelerated entry into atmosphere when the craft was experiencing uncontrolled descent. Pile of blackened ash was analyzed and the ash was confirmed of the same elements of layering. Ash consisted of fibrous dust and residue. Ash and all debris swept into bagging, bags placed in tag boxes, boxes placed into metal foot lockers, initial examination off-site, conducted at New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology, secondary examinations at Los Alamos facility, foot lockers subsequently airlifted by courier to Wright Field, Ohio. Information retrieved from the data banks of the command console panels within the disk it took a full year and a half to decipher the alien language, which resembled ancient Babylonian script. But with the help of World War II cryptologists who worked with the War Department, the code texts were broken and deciphered. All the results were shared with the offices of those overseeing the project, as it was known, among them General Curtis LeMay, Secretary of State George Marshall and President Truman and the intelligence operatives who oversaw security for the Roswell project. And he makes a very brief statement that in the journal it's talked about full alien communication or introduction to planet Earth on or by the year 2025. And that fit, it, fit to some degree into Buddy Bolton's timeline also. Now, if you are interested in learning more, back in 2019, I produced a seven part series at my Earth Files News website that includes these letters in print. So if you go to www.earthfiles.com, and on the far right of the headline page, click on Archive and scroll down to September 2019. There are about 3,000 reports now in my Earth Files archive. Go down to September of 2019. There is a seven-part series about the, quote, mysterious bismuth and magnesium zinc metal from the bottom of a wedge-shaped UFO of which I have just read a few excerpts. 
And now, Ian, let's start with Q&A with Brad's three-minute clock bell, and I'll try hard to stay in three-minute answers. Hi, Linda. Welcome back from Los Angeles. Thank you. And uh, thank you again for, uh, for giving us a good presentation and an answer on those letters that people were asking about. Yeah, there's, uh, I can see why it's always been, the letter have been controversial, but in the letters themselves to me and to Art, he put in quotation marks where this is from my dad's, granddad's journal. And then other, lots of other paragraphs seem to be his interpretation. Tonight, I was just focusing on the quotes that he quoted from his grandfather's journal. And I can see if people in 47, 48, 49, uh, when I talked with him on the phone and he was en route to Iraq and called me, I recall that he told me that he thought that his grandfather, it was actually a crash in 1948 or 49, not 47. Thank you for the clarification. Um, Linda, we're getting uh, quite a few super chats, so I'll just say uh, thank you very much to everyone who's uh, contributed to the super chats this evening. To Moonbird, Eric Ackerley, <laughs> Michelle Richardson, Demonic Hordes, who actually is driving a semi through Albuquerque tonight. Really? Mark Petri, Linda Emeterio, Joe Schmo, Sandra Lavender. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, you guys. And now, Ian, you and Brad are up with Q&A and a bell, and I promise I will try to get in as many of your questions as possible. You guys know I go into a tunnel when I start answering questions, and I can think of an awful lot often, but I will try to stay in the three-minute rhythm of all this. Okay, Linda. How many people have you spoken to in the so-called uh, alien abduction syndrome? Um, my estimate now is that I have interviewed at least 3,000 people from 1979 to 2022. Me alone. Second part of this question is, uh, were you at all on the fence about alien abduction before you started to speaking, speaking with people, and what changed your mind? I had uh, really no introduction, no exposure to either uh, the animal mutilations as an ongoing event or the uh, human abduction. Uh, it was not something that was on my radar when I was working uh, at KNBC in Los Angeles and then doing the medical programming at WCVB in Boston, and it was that night in the fall of 1975 when my brother called me and said, Linda, a huge UFO is setting down over one of the missile sites at Malmstrom Air Force Base and then told me about his experience of having to get the helicopter and getting a superior officer out flying and listening to Central Security Command and communication with the sabotage alert team and they were describing that this object was the size of a football field or maybe larger, and that uh, as the jets, there were jets that were uh, sent off and the sabotage alert team could hear or see the jets. And as soon as they could, they radioed back that the UFO started rising and then took off vertically and Dopplered as my brother would learn, Dopplered off the radar screen at something like 200,000 feet. And that was my first introduction, really. Uh, it, but that was because it was my brother who was calling me and telling me that this happened. And then within only a week or two after the, uh, we'll call it the interference or the, le uh, the hovering over uh, Kilo 7, at Malmstrom, my brother was missioned to fly a helicopter into an area where there had been animal mutilations in the Great Falls, Montana area, and Malmstrom was trying to help local law enforcement. They wanted to know because ranchers were finding circles of in the grass or hay or whatever was growing 
there were be circles somewhere near where there were mutilated animals. And my brother was tasked with lowering a helicopter on a controlled, so they knew what the altitude was above the ground, to see if the prop uh, motion of the helicopter blades, would it automatically make circles? And the answer was no, not like the circles that were found often at that period of time near mutilated animals. And what really got my attention is when my brother uh, called on another and said that he had learned that when they took the uh, took the target information out of the missile, they found the zeros and ones had been changed, and that was considered impossible. And the joke was, maybe the target was changed to Washington, D.C. Okay, Linda, what is your opinion on Lawrence Spencer's book, Alien Interview, where an alleged nurse in Roswell brought the information from a gray that we live in a prison that we are condemned to eternal cycle of reincarnation. I have read that entire book. I thought that the first third to a half that was more her firsthand experiences uh, about what happened and having the extraterrestrial biological entity brought into that hospital uh, and her interaction with the being and with the hospital staff and all of that, I thought that seemed genuinely detailed and firsthand. When it gets to the part of the book that goes into the huge uh, organization that is running uh, part of, the, of a galactic political system, that is in conflict with another big political system, it, uh, I confess that I, I constantly had the question in the back of my mind, this could be a uh, hour or two hour feature from Star Trek, but I have been exposed to so much high strangeness that if it turned out that the entire book was literally true, I wouldn't be shocked at that either. And the more I have been learning in just the last year that has now helped me to evolve and start making the maps that I've introduced to you all for the first time, in which around us, in our solar system, it's a rather crowded uh, area for other uh, civilizations, and I begin to feel that this is true and solid information, and that's why I decided just in the last couple of months that I would start working on that map and put it together. And what is it, the information that has come to me from these two very, very solid sources for over a year? that know that we have Space Force and 22 solar systems working with tall blondes and tall Nordics, and that everything is not peaceful, and that there are threats. Well, is that very much different than what is laid out in that book, allegedly, by a nurse who had the experience of being in the same room and trying to help an, a non-human being, I think that there are similarities, even if there are lots of differences. But I think it all boils down to right now, as we are in 2022, headed to 2024 and 2025, um, we might really truly be at the threshold of finally breaking open. We're not alone. And then a lot of these books and testimonies uh, may be verified. Let's, let's hope that we get that breakthrough. OK, too close. Right, Linda. <laughs> I'm combining uh, two or three questions in one here. Several people have referred to when you 
referred to the woman who saw her father shapeshift into a reptilian yeah. tall upright alligator type being now uh, if that girl saw her father as an alligator uh, as her original father or a duplicate would that make her a hybrid of sorts and following on from that wouldn't she be uh, a hybrid too or is this some sort of parasitic takeover not necessarily at all because one of the things that i have reported but if you if it hasn't sunk in i'm not surprised because there is so much uh in the last couple of months i have talked for the first time using a word that has been introduced to me specifically in the last 14 months h o l o f o r m We've talked about holograms. We've talked about 3D projections. We've talked about people reporting holograms when they discovered that a uh, cactus wasn't real because it disappeared. It was there and then it disappeared. But as I'm beginning to learn more and more details that I've never had before, the exposure on the word holoform is in the context of a threat the insects that are supposed to be of an extremely advanced civilization on Epsilon Eridani, only about 10 light years from Earth, and that those insects are a thousand years at least in advance of what we know as humans on Earth. And that there are two of their technologies that they have according to the tall whites and the tall Nordics that they have the most advanced technology to manipulate time, and they have the most advanced technology to project hollow forms on their insect being, and they can make the hollow form be anything that they want it to be. And the fact that the insects have allegedly chosen to present themselves when they are on Earth as blonde, blue-eyed, white-skinned beings has provoked in me the question, was World War II and Hitler's obsession because the insects had come to Earth pretending to be from Aldebaran and the political uh, agenda that they shared with Hitler, or, and you can go on with or and or, but right now, in the last 14 months, this picture with more details about a threat that was introduced to Ronald Reagan at Camp David, March 6 to 8, 1981, included this information, Mr. President. The fifth on our list of extraterrestrials is, is our trontoloids, and they are ugly insects who masquerade themselves on planet Earth to walk among us. They look like uh, blonde, blue-eyed, white-skinned humans, and I've been told it is a holoform, sophisticated projection of light in a 3D cover. And then the question I immediately have is, well, could you touch them? Can you, can you touch the holoform and it would feel... And I don't know the answer, but that is a, a word that I think is in play. Holo ETs are using holoforms uh, to look like humans to move among us. Okay. Thank you, Linda. That was good clarification. Linda, I'm still staying on the subject of ET species at the moment. Here's another question. Linda, what is your impression of the blonde Nordic aliens? Do they sneak and work among us? Someone says, I swear I saw one years ago. I'm not nuts as far as I know. And uh, we have had other people as well who have told us that they've seen shape-shifting ETs as well. William Mills Tompkins, who died at age, I think it was 94, about five years ago, and he uh, was able to produced at least two books uh, with uh, uh, the, I was trying to remember what he called the title, uh, and well, in any way, he, he worked and produced these two books, and 
in the books and I got to interview him for five hours. And in those five hours, he was sharp as a tack. And his early days as a teenager is how it all began for him. And uh, Ryan Wood and Bob Wood would pick up the story from him for these two books. And it was basically about his, from a teenager, having a kind of savant talent of being able to look at ships, airplanes, uh, military gear, and then go back and recreate it either in like architect architectural drawings or in 3D. He was hired with the, his parents' permission to work with the United States Navy during World War II so that that's what he'd do. They would give him photographs of various things of the enemy. In that case, it would be Germany and others. And he would construct his uh, architectural or technology or mechanical drawings so that our government would have help in understanding what the Germans and others during the war had and were developing. And the details always over and over and over again were so precise that eventually one day, as he told me in the recorded interview, they lay down some photos in front of him and said, we would li now like you to do the same drawings on this that you have been doing for us on ships and airplanes. And he's looking at disks and triangles and different shapes of UFOs. From that work, he says that that is how he was shown a photograph where Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong were coming down in July of 69, landing, and that he saw actual photographs of craft lined up on the crater rim that was not far from where uh, the uh, astronauts came down. And he claimed that there were one or more tall reptilian types that were standing out next to one or more of these craft and that he was then brought into the secret that the moon is uh, operated and is occupied in the middle uh, by computers that belong to reptiles, greys and others that the moon is a machine, he told me, and that someday the world will be shown the actual internal construction of our moon that was moved into place by extraterrestrial technologies that are that advanced. Okay, Linda, it's good going. Well done. Take a breather for a moment. We've got. Uh, I'm, I'm Anna, like within 30 in seconds, tonight, maybe. And she says she's lost a tooth, the sixth one. <laughs> wow. Um, we've also got um, the uh, Princeton scientists as well are here. Oh, good. What it, What is and their the, feedback on all of this? Sorry, Linda, I didn't catch what, that. What is their feedback on UFOs and ETs being from Princeton, but being interested in UFOs? Are they making any comments tonight? Um, well, I believe that they've actually contacted us by email already. We've got some oh, correspondence, I think, on file already from them. Uh, but they're in the show again this evening, just letting us know that they're there. Good. Welcome, you guys. Uh, I am always eager to see what your insights might be. So let me know. Okay, and I'll just catch up with a few more super chats as well. Shane, Whisper of Love, Tim Johnson, x 70, Separate Reality, Pegasus Red, Rat X172. Thank you, everyone. And Linda, could you please tell everyone to like and subscribe again, please? We've gotten through 198,000. We will soon be at 199,000, which means that we are really close to 200,000. And if you can help me tonight, click that red arrow to subscribe. And the guys also say it's important to uh, click on the like button if you like the Earth Files YouTube channel. And uh, I, I know that 
from the letters and emails and other correspondence that I hear from so many of you. I feel like we're bound as people who are convinced that we're not alone and that we've had experiences that support that and that we have this Wednesday night time to be as honest as possible where if we walk into a, a, a conference someplace else or a, a dinner party or somewhere with other people, we don't feel as free to talk as honestly. I'm hoping that this program will continue to help all of you, those who've been in military service, intelligence service, science, medicine, environment, that you have firsthand information about the presence of other intelligences that you will reach out to me in whatever way you're comfortable and we can have a dialogue on more information. That's been the power of the last 14 months with two sources that came to me because of the Earth Files YouTube channel. So subscribe and like. Are you there, Ian? Did we lose Sorry, him? thank you, Linda. The lights have just shot up, so thank you for that. Thank Linda, you. we've got a question here referring to the Reagan briefing. Uh, you refer to the Reagan briefing of March of 81. Uh, do you have a transcript or have you heard about a later in the year briefing in October of that same year? Casey, others bring up that Reagan would get a further briefing in October. Do you know anything about this? If it has been printed in the Serpo material, um, then I would have that. I have a very thick, not just what was originally put out back in the 2004-05 time period, 2005, um, I have a very thick Serpo release. I think that that is what you are relating to, and it gets the, uh, we'll call it our Serpo Space Force, this big, thick material that I have gets them to a planet in the Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2 system, and lots of details about how difficult it is for the humans to trust the greys, and that they feel that they are always being placated or uh, that there's deception. And that part of the Serpo material that I have read that is separate from the Reagan briefing, totally separate as far as I know, it is quite fascinating to read. But like so many things, journalistically, we need some kind of first-hand information that supports it. When it comes to the Reagan briefing, March 6th to 8th, 1981, I've reported to you and written before that I received from a very trusted source in Washington, D.C., going back uh, probably, uh, probably at least 20 years, that told me that Reagan had been briefed at Camp David and that the whole Spielberg movie where the men uh, in the orange jumpsuits at the end of the Spielberg film uh, get onto the UFO to take off to go and that it was true that Reagan said to Spielberg uh, something like, uh, you and I may be the only two people in this room, the White House, who know how true the ending of this film is. And it was Reagan talking to Spielberg, allegedly. Okay. Thank you, Linda. Can you, can you tell me, tell our audience, what you think is the most important piece of, of proof that we have of alien life to pay attention to? The Sphinx. Cheops, Oyan Taitambo in Peru, something like 19 by 28 feet of this solid stone high up in the Andes. I've been there with, with just extraordinary precision. And another that's beginning to come into my thinking more and more. And that is the carvings of 
language that we say might be Sanskrit or might be Egyptian or might be uh, Mayan. Remember when I did so much reporting in the 2007-2008 time period on the quote-unquote dragonfly drones. And that's when I was getting photographs, illustrations, uh, uh, like a dozen witnesses that came all at once. And I was doing a lot of reporting at Earth Files. And that's when the famous Isaac uh, communicated to me and communicated to Lex at Coast to Coast AM a document that allegedly came from a Palo Alto underground lab, the carrot document, and it had to do with back engineering extraterrestrial technology that could then be inserted into the commercial interactions of the American and eventually the world populations, uh, sort of what uh, Philip J. Corso talked about in The Day After Roswell, inserting back engineering, extraterrestrial, known extraterrestrial technology, and getting it in to the commercial distribution into the world and applying. And in the process of doing all of that work and having Isaac send me the documents, the, the most important part of what Isaac testified to firsthand was that his skill was in the zero and one world of, te of doing software in computers. And he said he was giving me uh, his insights about the symbols that were seen on some of the photographs of these strange dragonflies. And then he said, this is self-activating software that is superimposed on the surface of these craft it is superimposed on everything in the extraterrestrial universe, and he compared it this way. He said, if you know how to embed all of your code into everything, into the very makeup of structures, walls, floors, moving vehicles, he compared it to a piece of paper. Linda, they can put the self-activating software in a piece of paper. All you have to do, or they, is telepathically think to the paper exactly what you want it to convey, where you want it to go, in the building you are, another building somewhere else. You give the code to go. The paper takes off. It may work like a fax machine. It literally deconstructs into energy and goes through a process and comes out, whether it's a mile or a thousand light years away, and it then reconstructs itself, it delivers the information, and could do the same thing in return. He said that is self-activating software, and the beings that are responsible for the dragonfly drones, they are... Uh, expert at it, and he made a statement that reminded me about uh, the uh, tall uh, whites, that one of the sources said the tall whites were like being next to somebody who had a cray or 10 crays for a brain. Isaac, back in that 2007-ish time period, uh, said that the brain power of the non-humans who were responsible for the self-activating software was in many ways overwhelming to a normal human mind. But he was capable of learning how to work with it. So we're probably already working with them on self-activating software and it is in our own world. And one last sentence for you to think about, and I know I'm going beyond the bell, but this is important. Think of the basalt walls two miles underground in Antarctica that Spartan won in my documentary, uh, Alien Secrets Beneath the Ice. All over, huge, gigantic 80-foot walls expanding through nine acres, and that every single symbol 
was exactly the same depth going into that dense basalt, and they were doing it by laser measurement, and that the only thing in talking with him about it, I said, that sounds like the self-activating software that I have encountered before, but it would be able to change the molecular structure of limestone, granite, basalt, in a way that has to be operating at the atomic and the molecular level. And that would mean that those big, huge uh, um, walls or structures would automatically have all of this embedded software, quote unquote, in the fabric of how they were built. Think of the Sphinx. Think of Cheops. Think of Ollantaybo and go around the world to all of the ancient sites that have often very detailed symbols and that it might all be related to self-activating software when they were interacting maybe full-time with non-humans here. I'm very provoked by that as an area that all of us can hopefully learn a lot more about. And we probably are working with them with self-activating software everywhere right now in those 22 solar systems. Okay, <laughs> I went over, I know. Linda, don't worry, the audience don't mind you going over the bell. That's, <laughs> that's fine when, when we need a clarification on a, on a good question. Thank you. Linda, um, what is your most rewarding case you worked on or story you reported on? rewarding in the sense of moving not just my mind and my heart, but it felt like my soul, was the Linda Porter case that is in my third book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, High Strangeness. That's the 106-page chapter that I've talked about, where there are the tubes. And inside the tubes, with light at the top and light at the bottom, that is communicated to Linda through, she's dealing with a praying mantis, she's dealing with grays, uh, she's dealing with little, little grays that are clearly AI. And she gets the understanding that the, the beings that are in the tubes of light are a mixture, that there are tall Nordics, tall red hairs, tall black hairs, tall brown hairs, pales. There's a whole huge mix. And then there she sees humans. Clearly, from her point of view, there are humans and they're mixed in among these tall ETs inside of these tubes. And the tall gray that is dealing with her between the praying mantis and the little AI grays. The taller gray gives her a demonstration about how they do this, and then she gets this overwhelming education in her mind telepathically. It is vital, the word vital, it is vital that the entity, and she gets the in her mind suddenly this entity soul, it is vital that the soul remain with a specific body matter container for a specific period of time. And that's what we are doing here. And this is what we are going to do with you, Linda Porter, because you had rheumatic fever as a child and you will die of heart disease if we do not translate you into the light that was the phrase that the praying mantis used. We are going to translate you into the light. And they demonstrated on the man and said, this is now what we will do with you. And she had seen the gold light come from the, at the base of the neck where the shoulders hook in the bones. That this gold light had come out of the man and had moved across the room and had gone into one of the preserved bodies in the tube that looked like the man, except that the man who died was quite ill 
and looked older, but the one in the tube, it comes suddenly to life. And they take that man out, explain to her he will be sent to Australia, so there will be never any crossing of road of paths with his family, which I believe was in Wisconsin. And that whatever their duty, responsibility, work to keep matching souls and containers, whatever that means, it would continue with that man and they were going to reconstitute Linda Porter so that she would not die young. And that was the translation into the light. I feel that in that 106-page chapter, of which I've just been talking about in these excerpts with Linda Porter, if we understood everything that is being described by the non-humans to the humans, because I don't just understand it all, I think we'd be closer to why they interact with Earth and humans and do it so secretly. Okay, one more. Okay, Linda, uh, this is a question regarding something that I've researched myself for several years, and I don't know what, whether you have or not, but Jutera Boo says to ask you if you have any information on dogmen or werewolves in your decades of research. No, it has never, ever come up outside of the Skinwalker Ranch and talking with uh, Mr. Sherman, who, when he was an owner of the ranch, who he sought me out uh, back in around uh, 1996 and wanted to talk with me about the orbs and the shadow people and the craft and uh, his family was scared and all of that. Among the phenomena at the Skinwalker Ranch in the Uinta Basin in Utah is the now much told story of the wolf with the shoulders of the wolf up, estimated to be five feet off the ground, the shoulders of the wolf. But that when they saw the wolf come and try to grab at calves, and uh, one, of, uh, one of Sherman's colleagues or family uh, pulled a gun and then shot, shot right into this huge wolf. And the wolf had no reaction whatsoever to the bullets and turned around and just trotted off. And then they tried to follow and they got to a point, there were some tracks for a while and then there were no tracks. That is a story that I've heard often of uh, ranchers who have seen a beam of light or they may have seen a craft and they follow, if there's any tracks around animal mutilations, which there normally are not, but if there are some that they have followed and they disappear. Well, if we are, if we're dealing with hollow forms, a concept that really has not made much sense to humans because we cannot imagine photons being so controlled that they could have an entire camouflage that could move among us and we would think they were wolves, dogs, humans, panthers. I think that is, that is a truer insight into why some of these strange, even the chupacabra, they might be holoforms to mix up humans but it's still somebody else's advanced technology. Does that make sense, Ian? Yes, it does. And uh, I think it answers um, the original question uh, that, that you haven't actually done any research in, or come across this cryptid yourself um, in, in, your, um, in your investigations. Right, right. Okay, okay Linda, I've got to um, just want to make it clear that Hannah your granddaughter was in the um, in the audience tonight. She's the one I was talking Are about. Are you there? You if you're too. there, I love you, love you, love you. She'll see it tomorrow if she's not there now. Oh, Hannah is the one who lost the sixth tooth. Now I understand. I'm, I was uh, saying something when you were saying, is that right? Hannah has now lost her sixth tooth? 
<laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> she wouldn't ever deny. Bless her heart. Oh, she's one of them. Talk about a diamond in the universe. My granddaughter, Hannah Mead. She is beautiful. Her, her teeth are in the process of evolution, and uh, she is something. And in a many ways, I find that when I'm working really hard on trying to understand another facet of all of this, I see Hannah's face. She's seven years old. She is so bright. She is so, so full of energy. She is creative. She is the kind of energy anywhere in the universe that I would think that the divine field wants that energy to be evolving, to be what this universe is about. Hannah, it's a Hannah universe. That's what we want, not a shadow. So on that note, tonight, I hope I got through a lot of questions more quickly than normal. And it seems to me like we covered some really interesting ground. And next week, I'm going to have part two with Buddy Bolton on some other remote viewed questions. See you next week. And I love you guys. I really love you. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. I don't have to put them in select a language or, uh, bind them anywhere they love and the captions will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads I never had a cat do that before and they'll pull against the comb helping me get out snarls and I think it's the best they've ever been